Uh, well, welcome everyone. It's a beautiful morning outside, some water coming from the sky. And uh, I'm, I'd like to recognize our beautiful and talented Barbara Tanner, who is very much behind this entire operation. And Barbara, would you take a little hand of appreciation from us? <clears throat> She is an amazing woman, and I won't even tell you her age, and she won't either, but she is delightful and uh, as quick a mind as ever existed in Utah and has a great love of our environment and has made major sacrifices to bring this sort of thing together. You know, projection is sometimes an issue for our panelists. If anyone would be a little more comfortable up front, we'd love to have you. You don't have to come. This never worked in my classroom. So I thought I'd try it here and see what happens. Okay, great to see you all. Uh, this morning we shift uh, our attention to the importance of having not only water but clean water. Dirty water works sometimes for various things, sometimes in industry and elsewhere, but we cannot have dirty water around us physically and we can't have it around us if it destroys the beauty and the nature that uh, our lands and we depend on. Um, we've had our own incidents here in Utah of some traumatic, if not cataclysmic incidents. Very recently, the Chevron oil spill affected uh, a major urban stream in Salt Lake City. Uh, and that cleanup process goes on even today, well over a year later. And uh, I'm glad we've got a cleanup process, but I worry about when the mayor of Salt Lake City tells me there are almost 40 other pipelines that traverse through our valley that could do the same thing to our riparian and water zones. So this is a major concern, not only in rural areas, but in urban areas, how we deal with it, what we do, how we secure those pipelines, how we deal with their declining age and thus more frequent in, uh, uh, problems. So uh, we worry about our wildlife, we worry about our riparian zones, we worry about our biological life, our plant life, and we've just simply got to put the effort into making uh, clean waterways uh, available to all of us. Well, we have three people who are amazing here today who have spent a big part of their lives working on this very issue. Uh, they will present for about 23 minutes. We have a little bit of extra time, so we're going to give them 23 minutes, 25 minutes or so, to make their statements, to deliver their, their work. And then uh, and a couple of them, Walt indicated an idea that he might want to have questions in progress. Uh, that's up to the presenter, of course, but we will have a question and answer s session afterward. So if you do have a question, please uh, remember it and, and bring it forward. Our first presenter is, is Bob Adler, Robert Adler. Uh, I've known Robert for many, many years. Uh, he's a, a been a tremendous contributor for not, to not-for-profit groups, environmental groups in our, in our community. When I was at Utah Rivers Council, I was able to call Bob and get tremendous advice on, on the things we were working on and a lot of help on legal questions and what, how do we do this and how do we do that. We just discussed a very important legal question a moment ago. Uh, Bob is the James Farr Chair in Law at the University of Utah's S.J. Quinney College of Law. He got his B.A. degree from Johns Hopkins University and a J.D. from Georgetown University. Uh, and then he practiced environmental law for 15 years. So he goes into the academic world as a practitioner and knows the ups and downs of daily legal work. He regularly teaches courses in environmental law and water law and recently launched a new environmental clinic in cooperation with the Western Resource Advocates, an organization that does substantial substantive work on issues of this sort. Um, Bob is, uh, again, available to local groups uh, all the time, and we appreciate him very much. And it might be a little better if I introduced our presenters in sequence rather than all at once. So I'll come to Joy when Bob gets through and then get to Walt. Bob, great to have you. We're looking forward to your remarks. Thank you very much, um, Ted. It's uh, nice to be back before you this morning without my tie. 
truth be told, I hardly ever wear a tie anymore, but when I speak in our moot courtroom, somehow I think I have to at least pretend to look like a lawyer. So I'm here looking more like a professor today. So this panel um, is, um, as Ted says, shifting from just quantity to quality issues, but I think it's also about linkages. Um, and um, I can actually see better without the glasses than with them. Um, so we've been discussing how inadequate access to water um, affects human rights, but we all realize the critical linkages um, and connections between water quantity, water quality, ecosystem health, human health, and community well-being. Um, and as the title of my talk suggests, um, I want to suggest that this idea of the individual human right um, to water, although valid, is better implemented or best thought about in terms of community rights and responsibilities. Uh, I think to some degree that was suggested in part by some of the talks yesterday afternoon about privatization of public goods. So let me begin <clears throat> with four premises about what I think is necessary to make a human right to water meaningful. And then I want to follow up with two um, assertions that follow from those premises about what's necessary, necessary to make a human right to water achievable. Um, and I don't have enough time to give a full empirical case for this, but I want to follow up with some data and some examples um, of why this conceptualization might be useful. So my opening premises, um, some of which may seem um, self-evident to this audience. Premise number one, a human right to water must um, include access to clean and safe water supplies. It means little to have enough water if you die from cholera in the process. Um, and Justice Sandra Day O'Connor in a very famous seminal um, U.S. Clean Water Act case said that any effort to separate water quantity from water quality is, quote, an artificial distinction. Um, likewise, General Comment uh, 15 by the U.N. High Commissioner on Human Rights says the right to water entitles everyone to sufficient, safe, acceptable, physically acceptable, and affordable um, water for personal and domestic uses. So the human right to water is necessarily a human right to clean water. Premise number two, a human right to water requires a sufficient quantity of water. We haven't really talked about quantity um, per person yet, um, but it requires a sufficient quantity of water not only for bare su survival, but for a decent quality of life. And I use that term decent in a considered fashion. By decent, I don't mean as much water as any individual might covet, say, to fill their swimming pools or to irrigate their bluegrass lawns in the desert, because that guarantee or that conceptualization of a right to as much water as you want um, simply encourages waste. I mean enough water to support a healthy, reasonably dignified quality of life. So the relationship between quantity and quality is reciprocal. If water supplies are polluted, they don't count. They shouldn't count towards our goal of providing a sufficient quantity of water for all peace, people to live a decent life, as I've defined it. Premise number three, sufficient water to live a decent life includes more than just water for domestic uses. That is more than enough water just for drinking and bathing um, and um, culinary um, purposes. The, it includes sufficient water in quantity and quality to support sustainable economic activities suitable to the place, community economics suitable to the place, water to support community as well as individual health and well-being. The suitable to place qualifier um, is likewise important because it eliminates the assumption of enough water to support whatever economic activities one wants to conduct um, in a way that's inappropriate to an area's water supply, right? We need to support economic activities that are appropriate, not irrigating water, water consumptive crops that are not needed to feed um, the local population being one example. Premise number four. Just as it is artificial to distinguish between water quality and water quantity, it's artificial to distinguish between human and ecological water needs. Um, and again, this concept is a reciprocal one. Providing and protecting human water supply isn't possible 
or it's at least um, significantly more difficult if we don't protect watersheds, if we don't protect wetlands and riparian areas and floodplains and aquifer recharge zones and so forth. But likewise, protecting aquatic ecosystems isn't possible if human water uses and critically their associated land uses are irresponsible. If we use too much water, if we improperly dispose of our waste, if we use and develop land in ways that are too intensive or otherwise inappropriate or inadequately attentive um, to the hydrological realities or resilience. So stated more simply, and guided by the ethical teachings of Aldo Leopold, what I'll call the water community um, that merits attention, derivative of Leopold's famous land community, is broader than the community of human use. It includes the community of ecosystem use as well. So those are my four opening premises. Again, they might seem basic to many of you, um, but there are two associated assertions that I want to um, develop in the talk. Um, assertion number one is that contrary to what I think is um, the tenor of the current political debate and perhaps a political fad that promotes the notion that rights are absolute, my view is that all rights have accompanying responsibilities. So just to choose a somewhat uncontroversial example, if there's a right to bear arms, certainly there's a responsibility to use them safely. And likewise, if there's a human right to water, there must be an accompanying responsibility to use it responsibly, to use it without waste, to use it without polluting it, um, to use it in ways that protect watersheds and aquatic ecosystems. Assertion number two. Um, and I want to be careful about this. Although I, I agree entirely with the concept of an individual human right to water. Um, and human rights typically um, suggest individual rights. You know, the liberties that I talked about in introducing Peter um, yesterday afternoon are typically thought of in terms of individual rights. It may be more useful in achieving that goal to conceptualize them as community rights and responsibilities. And this realization focuses on this linkage, set of linkages that this panel um, is talking about between individual water use, community water use and management, and the water needs and uses of the ecosystems in which those um, communities exist or of which those communities are a fundamental part. So although we use water sometimes individually or in family units, other water uses are community uses. And likewise, it's really at the community level, not the individual level, that we arrange for water supply, that we arrange for water distribution, allocation, and protection. And in an ecological sense, water is clearly a community resource and not an individual resource. So the necessarily, necessary corollary of those ideas is that um, communities have both rights and responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis water and vis-a-vis -vis water use to one another in what I'll call both a horizontal, horizontal sense and a vertical sense. So there are at least two manifestations of um, the horizontal, sen horizontal sense. And what I mean by horizontal is as between communities at like level of government organization. So between nations, between states, between cities or other communities. Um, manifestation number one is that usually we have upstream and downstream communities where one community's use has the potential to affect another's. Um, and there is an accepted, but often very difficult to enforce legally, obligation of upstream communities to use water in ways that don't harm downstream communities. Um, second, there are also communities with superior access to water, either because they have more money or because they have more water or because they have more technical expertise. And I would assert that the, this notion of reciprocal community rights and responsibilities um, suggests that water-rich communities have an obligation um, or a responsibility to help provide water um, to water-poor communities, either through financial assistance or through technical assistance or through direct water grants where that's necessary to um, provide equitable water supply between horizontal communities. In the vertical sense, by which I mean as between higher and lower nested levels of government, um, again, I think there are two manifestations. One is that higher levels of government have an obligation, a responsibility 
to assist lower levels of government in providing adequate supplies of clean water to their communities. Um, and second is the federalism sort of notion in the U.S. analogy, um, which is that the higher level of government has a responsibility to ensure equity among their communities in water quality and quantity, um, again, as appropriate to the place and its climate and hydrology um, and other relevant factors. So that's my basic set of points. Um, if I need to truncate the rest of the, uh, the talk, that's okay. I'll just try to fit the data in as I can. But there are some um, issues that I'm going to repeat from earlier talks just for emphasis, but I want to add some detail as well to build my thesis. So first, um, we all know that a large percentage of the global population lacks reliable supplies of clean, safe water, even in some cases for basic domestic needs. We've heard a lot about this earlier this week, but we haven't really talked about quantity, so let me focus a little bit on quantity. Um, in terms of water availability, a standard definition of a water-stressed community is one that, and you don't have to remember the numbers, just remember the relationships, is an area that has less than about 2,000 cubic meters per person per year. A standard definition of a water-scarce community is one that has less than 1,000 cubic meters of water per year. There are large parts of Africa, the Middle East, and Asia that meet those definitions on the level of entire nations. Um, but beyond that, there are some nations um, that have less than 500 cubic meters per person per year. So that's less than half of what we define as water scarce. Um, and averages can be deceptive. National averages can be deceptive because by those criteria, South America is fine. South America is water rich because of the water in the Amazon basin, and yet there are portions of many South American countries that are quite water poor. And temporal averages can be deceptive because if a nation is at the level of 2,000 cubic meters per person for a year, per year and a drought hits, it becomes a water scarce region rather rapidly. Turning to water quality and sanitation, um, again, the facts are rather daunting. You've heard these before, so I'll say them um, quickly. Almost a billion people lack access to improved water supplies, which means that they're drinking raw, untreated, and untested water. Um, almost 2.5 billion pe people lack access to adequate sanitation. Um, you've heard the figures about the World Health Organization estimates of about 2 million deaths a year due to un um, on inadequate um, and safe water and sanitation. The UN estimates are even higher. Um, but what I want to focus on is some of the details and what some of the impacts are to human communities. Most of those deaths are attributed, attributed to cholera and other diarrheal diseases, but there are other sources of deaths and illnesses as well. 1.3 million people a year are estimated to die from malaria, 90% of whom are children under the age of five. 160 million people a year. I know Tom said we should you know, get away from the doom and gloom, and here I am giving you more doom and gloom. 160 million people um, a year are infected with schistosomiasis. 500 million people um, a year are at risk from trachoma, which leads to poor eyesight or blindness. 133 million people a year are infected by helminth worms, which lead to dysentery and anemia and cognitive um, impairment. These are mainly pathogenic forms of water pollution, but there's other forms of serious chemical contamination and ecosystem impairment, impairment around the world as well. So according to the World Water Assessment Program, um, there are high levels of toxic metals that we haven't talked about in uh, arsenic and other metals and water supplies in places like Bangladesh and Cambodia and other areas around the world. High levels of nitrates and nitrites in rivers around the world in places that you might not expect. Uh, developed countries like Japan and Switzerland um, have high levels of those pollutants. High levels of toxic organics, um, measurements of um, toxics like hexachlorocyclohenzene, uh, hexane in the Yellow and Yangtze and Pearl Rivers in China. 70% of industrial wastes in developing country are discharged without any treatment at all, any treatment at all. Um, similar statistics on loss of aquatic habitat around the world. A half of the world's wetlands have been lost since 1900. 60% of the world's uh, 227 largest rivers 
are significantly impaired and, impaired and fragmented by dams and diversions um, and canals and other um, impairments. As many as 80 fish species have gone extinct around the world since the late 19th century. So the data on deaths and illnesses alone are shocking enough. But what I really want to do is to use those um, data um, to draw linkages to overall community and ecological well-being because these impacts cause cycles of poverty that make the water ills difficult to get rid of. Note, for example, that many of the d diseases disproportionately affect young children, leading to high infant and child mortality. That leaves women in those communities in a perpetual cycle of reproduction, which reduces their ability to participate um, in other economic endeavors contributing to their communities. Note that many of those diseases leave millions of people incapacitated, even if they don't die. Cognitive impairments, blindness, anemia, chronic stages of gastrointestinal and other distress. And that, in turn, reduces their ability um, to um, contribute to their communities economically um, or otherwise, especially during the frequent, increasingly frequent droughts that we're seeing in places like the Horn of Africa, the Sahel re region of Africa, inadequate access to water means that many people, predominantly women, walk long distances every day, sometimes up to 15 kilometers a day, simply to provide subsistence levels of water supply to their families. And obviously that reduces drastically their abilities to contribute economically and otherwise to their um, communities. Um, and note that many of the problems that lead to human illness also lead to environmental degradation, which reduces the productive capacity of the land to support sustainable human economies. So, for example, poorly designed irrigation systems lead to soil erosion, reservoir sedimentation, which further reduces the capacity of the land, which further reduces water storage capacity in those communities. It's a declining cycle. Inadequate sanitation contaminates downstream waters, which reduces the capacity of those water bodies to supply fish and other food supplies for those communities. Unsafe water supply renders food supplies unsafe, making them unsuitable or undesirable for export, which means that those communities can't use them to generate cash, um, to generate currencies for their um, communities. When traditional agricultural communities and livestock communities are impaired due to inadequate water, those communities very often turn to much more unsustainable economic activity simply to make a livelihood, like clear-cut logging or intensive mining, which further impairs the ecological well-being of those communities in terms of their ability to have a sustainable economy. So all of this underscores that um, adequate access to clean and safe water and to healthy ecosystems is a fundamental linchpin, not only of human health and ecological health, but of the community economic well-being. And when the community economic well-being can't be sustained, that means that those communities don't have um, access to the capital and the technological resources to improve the water supplies. It is a vicious cycle that's all linked together. So I could end my litany of bad news there. That's depressing enough. But then I'd leave this misimpression. We haven't talked an awful lot about the United States. I'd leave the misimpression that these issues and problems are limited to the developing world. And unfortunately, that's not true. Um, needless to say, much of the news in the United States is much better. Most Americans are served by modern drinking water treatment systems and distribution systems. And I don't want to minimize the fact that we've got drinking water standards problems in the United States. We've got contamination problems that we have um, still to deal with, but they pale by comparison to many other countries. Most Americans are now served by um, modern sewage collection and treatment system, uh, systems, modern sanitation systems, the vast majority at secondary treatment or better. And Again, I could talk about gaps in compliance and enforcement, um, but we're still doing better um, than the rest of the world. But there are at least two major respects in which clean water and community well-being warrants attention here in the United States as well. 
First, there is a discrete but disturbingly large segment of the American population um, in which, uh, and these are predominantly disadvantaged minorities, which suffer from the same kinds of waterborne ailments and problems as the developing world. So I would recommend to you a paper published by Dr. Peter Hotez of George Washington University in 2008 in a somewhat obscure journal called Neglected Tropical Diseases. Uh, the paper is called Neglected Infections of Poverty in the United States of America. And the article documents at least five rather large communities in the United States um, with substandard plumbing um, and water or sanitation, which lead to disease burdens that are actually quite similar, not as bad, but quite similar to those that we've been talking about in the develop, developing world. So region number one is Appalachia. Um, in 2000, it was estimated that 169,000 households had no indoor plumbing whatsoever um, in those areas. Almost 3% of the region lacked indoor, complete indoor pump plumbing, in some counties as high as 25%. As of the late 1970s, infection rates in those communities for um, diseases like ascariasis, which is a parasitic worm, in school children were in the 13 to 14% range in some communities. And has it gotten better since then? We don't know. There have been no surveys since the late 1970s as to whether or not this problem has gotten better. The Mississippi River Delta um, and the former Cotton Belt region, similarly high rates of tuberculosis, parasitic infections, ascariasis, roundworm. Disadvantaged urban areas in the upper Midwest and in the Northeast, very high rates of rat-borne and louse-borne infections, bacterial infections, toxicaria um, infections that impor, impair the health and the productive capacity of people in those communities. In many urban communities, the homeless constitute a community within a community at which um, uh, parasitic and other infection rates are extremely high. Region number three is the Mexican borderland region. Um, very high rates of substandard housing, an estimated 30,000 housing units without um, indoor plumbing, not including mobile homes, which is a very large percentage of those, community, of those communities. Again, high infection rates of vector-borne diseases. So, for example, a recent survey in Brownsville, Texas, found infection rates from dengue fever between 2% and 7%, with up evidence of up to 40% of people who have had dengue fever infections at some time in the past. Um, estimates of Chagas disease, which is related to waterborne um, illness, even higher, upwards of over a million Hispanic Americans are estimated to have Chagas disease, over a quarter of a million in Texas alone. Region number five, and we'll hear something about it more um, later this morning, um, are Native American tribal regions where there are some areas with up to 20 percent of homes that lack complete indoor plumbing, five times the national average. Um, high rates of infections such as trachoma, um, cystic, um, uh, echinococcosis, and other diseases. So what about the rest of us? Um, lest we be too complacent about our own health, um, on a national basis there are as many as two and a half million cases of Giardia um, and 300, thank you, um, 300,000 cases of um, cryptosporidiosis per year, both of which are water, waterborne diseases related either to drinking water or um, to recreational swimming waters. Um, and I'm largely not going to give Walt Baker a hard time today because I have plenty of other opportunities to give him a hard time, but I will regarding this one fact which is that, although it's not uncommon to Utah, Utah's surface water quality standards um, are at a level that allows a risk of illness to swimmers of eight to 10 infections per 100 swimmer days. Eight to 10 infections per 100 swimmer days in Utah's recreational waters. You go swimming um, at a public beach, um, Bear Lake or wherever, um, you get sick a week later, you get an ear infection, you get gastroenteritis. Maybe it's not so bad, but you may think it was something you ate that might have been from swimming in that water. 
if you have an impaired immune system, um, that might be a serious health impairment rather than just a minor inconvenience. Reason number two why we um, can't be too complacent in the United States. We've invested hundreds of billions of dollars in the United States in water and sewage infra uh, treatment infrastructure, but the future needs are quite significant, and if we don't maintain that infrastructure and we're headed in that direction, then some of the problems that we're talking about now are going to get worse. EPA's most recent water quality needs survey, May 2010, identified total funding needs over the next 20 years of nearly $300 billion. That's for wastewater collection and treatment, for a combined sewer overflow correction, for stormwater management, and so forth. EPA's most recent drinking water needs survey identified another $335 billion in needs for the next 20 years. That's a total of $665 billion in needs, about $33 billion a year. Sounds like a lot of money, and it is, um, uh, especially in a political climate with cries to reduce federal spending, um, to reduce the federal deficit. But I'll note that just the proposed increase in the defense budget this year under a Democratic administration in an austerity year, just the increase is $8 billion a year, which is about a quarter of what we need to meet our total water and sewer infrastructure needs per year. So just a few um, take-home um, messages to sum all this up. Um, there is a basic human right to water. I agree with that. But it's at the community level that it has to be fulfilled. And that includes providing both enough water and enough clean water to protect both human health and ecosystem health. Second, I'll leave the privatization issue to the experts. It's a debatable subject. We had a great discussion of it yesterday afternoon. But at a minimum, it suggests that if communities at any level believe that privatization is the best way to serve their communities, and perhaps it's a bit paternalistic for us to tell any given community how to govern itself, it doesn't rid that community of its responsibility um, at the public level um, to ensure that um, however their communities are served, they're served with adequate and equitable service at appropriate prices to the populations that are being served. Number two, communities have obligations to one another in this regard, again, at both the um, horizontal level and at the vertical level, um, to protect the equal right to water of downstream communities, um, to help the water poor communities to meet their needs. And perfect timing, thank you. And third and last, communities include not just human communities, but the ecological communities in which they're situated and which they're a part. Um, and I think we're going to hear a lot more about that from Dr. Zedler. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. I'm sure that stimulated some thought and some potential questions in a moment. And uh, I'd like to now uh, have the privilege of introducing Dr. Joy B. Zedler. Uh, Dr. Zedler is Professor of Botany and the Aldo Leopold Chair in Restoration Ecology. Quite an honor to have an Aldo Leopold Chair. That's pretty cool. Um, she uh, got her PhD at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, she is an expert in restoration ecology, wetland ecology, reestablishment of rare plants, interactions of navy, uh, native and exotic species, and adaptive management. She also stimulates her students to a wide variety of research opportunities in this very complicated area. Uh, her work at the University of Wisconsin Ar Ar Arboretum uh, allows her to direct that activity with her students. And she also directs them to work within the state of Wisconsin and the upper Midwest region. And we're delighted she's here today to have a national impact and to be with us here at the University of Utah. Dr. Zedler, nice to have you with us. Am I in the way of this? Thank you so much. It is just a real privilege to be here. This uh, symposium has been mind-expanding for me, and I am just delighted to have had the opportunity to come. Thanks to all of those who organized. I was counting on Dan McCool to um, 
provide some of that hopeful message. I'm afraid that I have some uh, bad news along with a little good news. Uh, here you see water that is not clean. This is dirty water coming into that wonderful arboretum where I spend half of my time at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Oops, go back here. I'm going to talk a bit about urban runoff and then agricultural runoff. My perspective, I've heard many perspectives on water today. My perspective comes from that of the ecosystem, the wetlands in particular, and uh, the uh, challenge of restoring something that has been degraded. So urban runoff comes in pulses. That's a problem, a big flush of water at one time moving very rapidly um, in large volumes is difficult to control or to clean or to manage because it um, mobilizes a lot of sediment, it destabilizes stream banks by erosion and brings that sediment into the stream and the water that it carries and it cuts deep channels and drains groundwater. As those channels get incised further into the soil, the groundwater in the surrounding land is able to flow down slope into that stream. So there's a concept called urban syndrome, urban stream syndrome that is the incised stream bed that drains the water from the surrounding land. So yes, um, we heard um, quite a bit about we cannot separate surface water and groundwater. It's brought together uh, here in an urban a stream with a syndrome of degradation. So surface water carries uh, a lot of things in it. It carries fertilizers from lawns. And I'll say a lot about nitrogen today because nitrogen is something that humans have created as a major mobilizing um, nutrient. We learned how to make fertilizer and that brought a lot of nitrogen to the land that otherwise would not be there. Um, it brings, surface water carries contaminants from streets and uh, comes, you know, coming off of our rooftops, our sidewalks, our streets, our gutters, and um, all of the things that are in that, uh, those places are mobilized and brought along with surface runoff. And the groundwater that's mobilized as well carries nutrients from things like septic systems. Even when there are sanitation devices, they're not always immune from contaminating the water. It just contaminates the groundwater, not the surface water. Urban runoff is, is high in nitrogen. Um, a recent study comparing uh, forested and urbanized watersheds upstream from Boston shows the reasons and the outcomes of degradation. The more we urbanize, the more land surface is hardscape, that is, impervious to water infiltration. In the watersheds compared by uh, colleagues in the, the Boston area, three times as much of the watershed area is impervious. Therefore, you get 25 to 40% more runoff. Therefore, you get 45% more nitrogen influx and five times the nitrogen discharge um, from the downstream portion of that watershed. So there's um, very few studies like this that actually compare the uh, ac exact amounts of nitrogen or phosphorus, the other major nutrient that we worry about, um, in runoff, but more studies are uh, on underway. Agricultural lands here in the upper right-hand corner also release contaminants. And uh, I took these pictures right next to where I live just last week when we had a, an unusual thaw that not only brought a lot of um, uh, nutrients and sediments into uh, mobilization, but also uh, catalyzed uh, major demonstrations in Madison, which I believe you've all heard about. <laughs> Thawing has a wonderful um, uh, mobilizing effect. But when it's a plowed field, such as you see on the left here, uh, a field that was plowed last fall unnecessarily, a cornfield across from where I live, um, it begins to discharge nutrients as uh, water flows off that land. It's all churned up. It's like hamburger. And uh, you blast water and run off on it, and it carries nutrients and sediments downstream across the road in a culvert in that first arrow, and then into a sedge meadow. And it's not just any sedge meadow. It's my sedge meadow. And it brings the nutrients onto a natural ecosystem, a remnant that I can't protect because I can't stop this from happening. Even a little agriculture and a little urbanization can release a lot of nutrients. And uh, this is a recent study from North Carolina where it uh, uh, 
it was a comparison of several watersheds that have different degrees of degradation um, in the form of urbanization and agriculture. And they were able to distinguish watersheds that discharged a lot of phosphorus or a lot of nitrogen on the basis of very small amounts of development within those watersheds. This is kind of scary because it indicates that a lot of watersheds that have a lot of development and uh, agriculture will be much harder to uh, reduce uh, contamination from. So we get more phosphorus where just um, as little as 5% of the watershed gets converted from wetland to farmland and where just uh, a little more than 1.7% uh, of riparian buffer becomes urbanized. And we get a lot more nitrogen when uh, more than 28% of a riparian, that is riverside buffer area, becomes urbanized. So clean water becomes dirty water. And that's what we've wor worried about uh, throughout this conference. It does so as it collects nutrients, suspended solids like sediment, uh, toxins, and pathogens that uh, uh, Bob so, uh, talked about so nicely just before me. And the reasons we care are, uh, were very well covered by him, so I won't even need to talk about that. But it's about both a decrease in the quality and the quantity of water that leads to human health impairment. So it's clear, uh, clean water becomes dirty. The real question is whether or not dirty water can become clean water. Can we reverse that arrow? And this is definitely dirty water. And yes, there are mechanisms by which we can do so. It'd be much better if we didn't dirty it up in the first place, if we didn't plow the fields in the fall, if we didn't put ni nitrogen fertilizer unnecessarily on lawns. Uh, but um, if we are choosing to do those things, we can restore wetlands within watersheds. And that's my preferred approach uh, if we can't stop dirtying the water. And if we can't restore wetlands sufficiently, uh, there are some engineered wetland systems uh, that uh, we might be able to consider once they're better improved. So I will just say some general things about restoring wetlands throughout watersheds to clean up that dirty water. Wetlands can remove pathogen, pathogens. The bacteria can denature the toxins. Uh, the creation of basins that will capture flows of water and slow those flows and settle suspended solids. That's a useful function of a, of a restored or constructed wetland. And wetlands can remove nutrients. And it's the bacteria that uh, can, can uh, transform nitrates to nitrogen gas that we probably owe the most to because they can take a pollutant and turn it into harmless air. After all, our air is 80% nitrogen already, and bacteria in wetlands, particularly in wetlands, not in uplands, can do this. And it's because of water. Water makes a difference. It makes the soil less um, porous to, or less, uh, less uh, able to uh, have oxygen present due to the bacterial activity and due to slow, di uh, slow diffusion rates. So where you have water, you can have anoxic or anaerobic soil, and you can get denitrification, this process of transforming nitrates to nitrogen gas. And then there are also lots of plants that like water, places with water, and the plants can take up the nitrogen and the phosphorus and turn it into plant biomass. And uh, if it's a woody plant um, or some of the tussock sedges that I'll talk about in a bit, it can hold that, uh, those nutrients for a long time. Um, there's some really uh, interesting plans coming out of uh, Europe to restore and create wetlands at the massive scale. Sweden has a target of restoring 12,000 hectares of wetlands. Um, they've got one-tenth of their target uh, achieved. In order to reduce the flow of nitrogen in particular from agricultural fields into the Baltic Sea, and the blue-green algae here um, sort of look yellow-green, but uh, that's probably just a, an artifact of the figure I stole from the website here. But um, there are hundreds and hundreds of wetlands being restored in Sweden and in Denmark and in other places. And uh, there's some concern by people that, well, wetlands aren't all good. They don't just release nitrogen as a gas. They can also release methane uh, because that same environment of low uh, air, low oxygen, can cause methane emission. 
and it, methane emission is a, d a problem for greenhouse gases because methane is like 30 times as bad as CO2 carbon dioxide in uh, green as a greenhouse gas. So I was really excited to see this uh, brand new paper. Uh, on a, it's a simulation model that indicates that you can have nitrogen removal without having a lot of methane emission, and it depends on how you build those wetlands and um, how they're vegetated. And the the, da the Danes. Um, I saw another recent paper that compares the, the efforts of the Danes in creating wetlands, and their wetlands, uh, well, let's say the Swedish, uh, excuse me, the, the Swedish wetlands um, remove about six times as much nitrogen as the Danish wetlands, and they're trying to figure out why, and in part it's where they put them in this watershed, and it's um, how they create them. Are they going back and digging big pits, big pits which are good for phosphorus removal, or shallow in undulated edges, um, wetlands that are good for nitrogen removal. So there, are, there is some science uh, to this process. Uh, the process of restoring wetlands to improve water quality can definitely be improved. So uh, rather than saying we're not doing what we should be, I'll just put it in a positive light, we can do a lot better at restoring wetlands so that they will remove more of the contaminants that we put in to make our water dirty. And um, with my research group, I, we are aiming to, uh, in, to do two things, to, to use vegetation in ways that it will improve the infiltration of water, to hold the soil in place so it won't erode, to resist the invasion of weedy plants, and to sustain that water cleansing capability. And uh, we're looking for native species, not exotics, but native species that have multiple functions. I call them super plants. And also assemblages of plants, that is multiple plants, that would behave as teams. If one plant can't do it all, like a super plant, perhaps a team of three could um, work together to improve water quality. So I found a super plant in my um, backyard, as well as in uh, the eastern half of the United States. It's a sedge. It's called tussock sedge. It builds this uh, uh, tussock or hummock that uh, is nicely seen in winter um, in my little sedge meadow that's gradually being overtaken by weeds. Um, but it's a plant that has multiple functions. It does multiple things very well. It takes up nitrogen and phosphorus very well. It also stores carbon in those tussocks, and those, um, those tussocks, according to my doctoral student, Beth Lawrence, are about 90% organic, so that's a long-term structure that persists. And um, a master's student, Michelle Peach, showed that those tussocks create microtopography on the landscape. They're about, about a foot tall. And that microtopography is very neighbor-friendly. It hosts a lot of other plant species. So we end up with nutrient removal, carbon storage, and biodiversity support by reestablishing this, at least this one species first in the restoration process. And then we figured out how to restore by growing these things in big t tanks that we call mesocosms. You might know them as cattle tanks. They hold about 150 gallons of water. And uh, we grow plants in them. And uh, the graph on the top indicates that if you manipulate the watering, the amount and duration of watering, uh, you can get tussocks of different sizes. The ones on the left are the biggest and the broadest, and that's with continuous uh, water at about half of a foot deep throughout the growing season. So now we know how to grow them, and uh, we know how to propagate them, and we can plant them out in restoration sites as a beginning. I don't think we should have single species restorations, but as a beginning. We also want to find, uh, for other kinds of systems, other than the sedge meadow, uh, teams of native plants that will work together. And uh, we started uh, testing some three species and six species teams, just uh, randomly drawing from native vegetation. But um, in this particular shallow water system on the edge of a stormwater pond, invasive hybrid cattails are outgrowing those natives. We need to work harder. So now back in our mesocosms, we're testing three species and nine species teams. And the nine species teams will have three um, of each kind of plant. We've, um, we've been working with um, oh, as many as 40 kinds of native plants. And uh, in this case, we've narrowed it down to about 21 species. 
and randomly drawing three species that have shallow roots on the left, most of the roots very close to the soil surface. We call them soil holders. That's a hopeful. Um, species that have much deeper roots in the middle there, we call those infiltrators, again, hoping that they can bring water down into the soil and reduce the amount of dirty water. Um, and then those that put more of their biomass above ground, uh, we hope to uh, find that they can compete with uh, invasive plants that don't belong in the ecosystem. So in those mesocosms, um, you know, 36 I guess in this experiment, uh, we predict, or the theory predicts, that those nine species teams will be the most productive, like having a, a, a basketball team with more than a couple players, we should have a better uh, outcome. So in a watershed strategy, which is really what we need nationwide, to make dirty water clean, we have to start with discharging fewer contaminants, especially when it's not necessary. It's not necessary to plow and fall. It's not necessary to dump excess nitrogen on a lawn. We need to conserve the existing wetlands. They're always under threat, certainly with uh, new legislation um, to eliminate certain kinds of wetland from protection under the Clean Water Act, namely isolated wetlands. And then to restore, starting with the former wetlands, nationwide, the lower 48 states have lost, in area, 53% of wetland area. And um, I'm not sure what Utah's rate is, but uh, Wisconsin's a little lower at 46%. California, where I was for many years, is way above at 91% loss. So there are plenty of places to restore former wetlands. And then, I think, use some of those native super plants and teams of plants to accomplish the um, a goal. But <clears throat> it won't work everywhere. And here's a watershed upstream of Washington, D.C. I don't know this watershed well, but there's some interesting numbers there. It already has 170 um, road intersections. It has, I uh, can't quite read the numbers here, 563 sewer crossings on streams and 549 storm drain crossings on streams. This watershed's pretty full of structures that are aiming to control the water, and there's very little place left for any uh, wetlands to cleanse the water. So then what do we do? Well, typically, we let it, uh, the water flow off the surfaces down to some lower point in that watershed down there at the bottom, and we attempt to engineer a system to make it do what we can't do upstream. And the Arboretum is in such a landscape position. It's the bottom of a large um, urban watershed surrounded by urban um, and some um, light industry. And each of these yellow arrows is a place where stormwater flows into this 1,200-acre conservation area. And the numbers on there are hard to see, but they range up to 500 and some uh, acre feet per year, indicating the volume of flow. And the challenge we have is to accommodate those engineering structures now that we have new EPA guidelines on what urban, uh, urban areas have to do to meet the law and reduce the total maximum daily load of contaminants. And um, this is where I need the help of most of the uh, other speakers and uh, many, much of the audience. Uh, the regulations are a difficulty for us. The regulations call for in specific kinds of engineered systems. Uh, the stormwater pond is considered the super um, uh, um, pond for uh, removing nutrients, and it has to be built in a specific way, and there's no room for the kind of system that will treat nitrogen rather than uh, in addition to phosphorus. This one is designed to treat phosphorus and suspended solids, and if you don't do that, you don't get your project uh, approved, and the city does not get its credits for stormwater treatment. So it must be this way. Now, ponds are not all bad. Ponds will settle some solids, because after all, you collect water and you can watch that happen. And some phosphorus attaches to the sediment grains, but all of the dissolved stuff uh, including road salt, which we have a, a lot of use for in um, the upper Midwest. So we get some treatment from a stormwater pond, um, and sometimes the water that is dirty becomes clear, but it should be very clear that clear water is not necessarily clean. 
This is a six acre stormwater pond. That's six football fields in size. It was designed to remove 80% of the total suspended solids from urban runoff in the Arboretum. And yet the nitrogen and the other dissolved contaminants flow right on through because it's a big deep pit. And to give some idea of the complicated system that um, it takes to remove some of those dissolved materials, here's the nitrogen cycle. I apologize, but it makes a point. It's complicated. And between each of these pools of nitrogen, there's a line, and that's a bacterial um, activity. And uh, a lot of that activity stays in the water. And then you see three things up in the air there, and that's because those are gaseous forms of nitrogen. So there are some ways that ponds can um, remove nitrogen from the water to the air uh, is in the form of ammonia on the left, N2, which is harmless nitrogen gas, and uh, nitrous oxide, N2O. So the, um, the thing that we would like to see is more of that N2 gas released by the bacteria. And if you design the system right, it can do that. The bacteria can do that. But it's going to take a different kind of system. It's going to take something that's vegetated. Plants are the answer. Um, shallow water plants, not deep water um, so much, but shallow water plants produce a lot of organic matter. And they, it oozes out of their roots it, in the dead material that accumulates. And that organic matter feeds the bacteria. And the bacteria can convert the nitrogen to that harmless nitrogen gas. So here's a system with uh, four, they're like vegetated ditches, and we call them swales. And um, it's a brand new system at the Arboretum that we're testing. We're comparing it with the conventional stormwater pond. So you see a big, long red arrow. That's uh, water coming from the street into a big pond. But we can shunt that water into the swale system and run it through our vegetated uh, swales or ditches. And um, the only problem is that uh, these ditches so far have been very disappointing. And we have what I call unrealized expectations and unintended outcomes. We can do better than these um, engineered systems. Let me illustrate. Here's an unrealized expectation. This whole swale system was supposed to infiltrate water. Well, once they dug it, they found out it was too close to the high groundwater level, and it had a lot of clay, so it's impounding water instead of infiltrating. An unintended outcome was that the, I think it was the equipment that was used to build this system, probably used on highways where they use crown vetch as a cover crop, um, introduced a weed. So we got weeds all over the berms that separate those um, ditches, and that required repeated herbiciding. That's not good for a water treatment system. Here's another unintended outcome. The engineers in doing this project insisted on adding six inches of topsoil to those berm, or to those um, ditches, and topsoil is full of nutrients. What sense does that make to add nutrients to a system that's supposed to remove nutrients? And as a result of lots of nutrients, invasive plants became dominant. They're cattails um, that are um, it's actually a native species. I don't mind cattails when, um, when I expect them. But we had um, quite a number of species that we wanted to grow there that we couldn't get to grow because the cattails are doing very, very well. So we switched our research to ask, oh, well, do, do the cattails uh, remove nutrients? And maybe it doesn't make sense to plant at all if we can get cattails free and if they'll do the job better. Um, we had sown 27 native species in different uh, diversity levels and combinations, and only one of them, the yellowish-greenish one, um, actually thrived in the system. I think the contractors had bad seed, but I can't prove that. So here's my uh, concluding um, uh, pair of uh, um, slides. That we have a lot of problems uh, in the process of making clean water dirty. It's all about urban development and agriculture. It's about the loss of wetlands in watersheds and the reduced ability for those, waters, those wetlands to clean the water. The engineered systems downstream only remove some of the contaminants. They don't remove enough. They don't remove what's, what's um, dissolved, and that includes a lot of the toxic materials that Bob talked about. And we have very few evaluations of the actual performance of these systems. They're all designed based on uh, simulation models. So I have a number of concluding recommendations. Um, obviously, we should obviously conserve and restore wetlands throughout watersheds. 
And in both the restored and the engineered systems, we should use uh, super plants if we can find them, the things that can perform multiple functions very well, and use teams of native plants to achieve multiple functions that we want to happen, the removal, the denitrification, the um, uh, reduction of invasive species. And obviously we should be testing the, for water quality improvement, not just expecting sediments and phosphorus to come out of the system, but to measure the nitrogen removal, measure the contaminants, the toxins, and the disease organisms that come out of these systems. We need to use more science. And thanks to all of my collaborators and their um, sort of fund, our funding source. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zedler. That is fascinating. Um, I'd like to now introduce uh, Walt Baker. Uh, Walt has been with the Division of Water Quality for the state of Utah for 26 years and has served as director for the last seven years. He serves as vice president of the Association of State and Interstate Water Pollution Control Administrators and chair of the Water Quality Committee of the Western States Water Council. As a member of the Utah's Lake Commission, as a member of the Utah Soil Conservation Commission, and as the Executive Secretary of the Utah Water Quality Board. He's a graduate of the Utah State University and is a licensed professional engineer. It's my pleasure at my job at the Governor's Office as Environmental Advisor to work with Walt regularly and uh, to see the great work he does. He's a, he uh, as our principal state regulator on water quality. He does a terrific job in trying to meet the many, many challenges we have in this state. And so it's my pleasure to ask Walt to come up and make his presentation. Walt. Ted, I wish you could have given that wonderful introduction to the legislative committee that I was before <laughs> yesterday, but um, it's a pleasure. Would have ruined to, you. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here today um, to, uh, to speak about uh, bringing these uh, big water quality issues down to what's going on here in Utah. So um, as I go forward, there may be some questions that, uh, uh, that we can take just as I go. So if there's something that... Uh, piques your interest, if there's a particular slide or something you don't understand, let's just take the questions as we go. <clears throat> well, I'm going to first talk a little bit about what's going on in the, the 2011 uh, legislative session. I thought it was going to be a yawner for me this year. Uh, you know, clearly budget is always an issue, but uh, I didn't see anything really on my radar screen, but uh, this has been one of the more active legislative sessions for me. One thing that I did not have on my radar, radar screen was uh, uh, angry uh, homeowners that are not now getting their dishes clean because of a phosphorus ban on dishwashing detergent that went into effect uh, a, a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we were not a sponsor of that bill. Uh, nationally, there were 10 states uh, really at the behest of the dishwashing detergent industry uh, that decided uh, that this was the right thing to do, the good thing to do. My grandmother, frankly, was right when she said the ounce of uh, prevention is worth a pound of cure, and when it comes to nutrients, and uh, particularly phosphorus, uh, that is certainly the case. So if we can keep it out of our wastewater systems, and uh, that will keep it out of our uh, streams and our lakes. Uh, but uh, apparently there were folks angry enough about uh, their dishes not getting clean. And let me just say what phosphates do in dishwashing detergent. Uh, uh, they, uh, we've got hard water here in Utah. And so phosphates, one thing they did, uh, they served as a water softener. And uh, once you remove the phosphates, then uh, oftentimes the glasses would come out of the dishwasher spotted, as you can see that mineralization occur. Another thing that phosphates do, they are a builder. In other words, they prevent food particles from adhering to plates. And uh, 
uh, uh, allow that rinsing uh, that occurs in a dishwasher to be more effective. And so uh, in any event, I was being stopped in the grocery stores by former neighbors saying, what on earth have you done to my dishes? And uh, angry emails and uh, uh, even my daughter accosted me. And so that was uh, the, you know, the final straw, I guess. But there are things that are working now. Uh, Consumer Report had a great layout on uh, uh, phosphorus-free dishwashing detergent, and there are many other alternatives to the phosphorus-laden detergent. The phosphorus is adding about 15% more with phosphorus in detergent, adding about 15% more of the phosphorus uh, to our wastewater treatment plants. And our wastewater treatment plants, at least here in Utah, are very ineffective of removing phosphorus. And so there was a bill sponsored by uh, Representative Sandstrom to let's go back to the good old days. And uh, we did not take a position on it because, frankly, the dishwashing detergent industry has turned a corner. Uh, they are not going back to adding uh, phosphorus into dishwashing detergent. So it is really, from my impression, a moot point. But there were anecdotal stories about people going from Utah up to Franklin, Idaho, to not only get a lotto ticket, but to buy phosphorus-laden dishwashing detergent. Uh, I uh, don't think that that's the case because we couldn't find any place in Franklin or Wendover or Evanston or uh, Mesquite that had any uh, phosphorus uh, detergent. But in any event, that uh, has come up this legislative session. It did not pass, but I think there will be another run at it this week, and we'll just have to see where that goes. Uh, DEQ Department Musical Chairs. Uh, uh, the, uh, we're not exactly sure where DEQ is going to wind up. It is, a, it is a, on the governor's cabinet right now. It is an independent agency, but there's been talk about moving it over to agriculture, moving it over to the Department of Natural Resources, uh, uh, and other variations on that theme. So uh, I'm reading the papers just like the rest of you to find out uh, if I need to uh, relocate my office. But uh, thus far, there's... Uh, uh, it's an independent agency, and frankly, I think the mission of the Department of Environmental Quality is different than, uh, uh, than a DNR or AG or, uh, 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 you know, other independent agencies as well. Revising the Utah Water Quality Act. That uh, for 58 years, the Utah Water Quality Act uh, on our state level has been like the Clean Water Act that came along 20 years after the Utah Water Quality Act. Uh, on the national level, but that act uh, protects our waters. I uh, won't get into elements of that act, but uh, 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 it has its foundation, I think, in Western water law, frankly, and water rights. Uh, the water rights provisions in our law state that the resource is for the citizens. And in, uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, the same year that uh, uh, that uh, the, the ground, or the, excuse me, the water rights identified that that uh, the water is a resource to be allocated by the state engineer's office for the benefit of the citizens of the state of Utah. That same year, 1953, the Utah Water Quality Act came into being that said the resource is also to be protected. The water quality is to be protected for the use of the, of the citizens. And so I, I uh, 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 draw a great satisfaction in knowing that, that it is collectively uh, our water and we need to protect it uh, for our uh, universal use. However, this legislative session, there's an element that would come out and say, well, it is our water, but there are special kinds of water, and one is ag water. That's what this legislation would propose, and it's wending its way through committee passed yesterday, and uh, we're looking to modify it with the consent of the sponsor on the floor of the House. But it would say agricultural water is different, and it's okay to pollute uh, to some degree with agricultural water. It carves out a niche. I'm hopeful that the petroleum industry doesn't want its niche and the municipal industry doesn't want its niche for polluting and, uh, and so forth, uh, but we'll have to see how we can, uh, uh, you know, navigate this uh, difficult strait we're in. Uh, make up of the Water Quality Board. Also a bill is uh, in play that would bring, uh, uh, remove a municipal representative from the Water Quality Board and an at-large representative of uh, uh, representing the state in general from the Water Quality Board, replacing it with two more ag uh, representatives. So that would be some total of 25 percent of the board made up of agricultural representatives, I think, to protect the interest that, uh, of, of the ag community, they're just concerned about where water quality things are going right now nationally and even in the state. 
budget. Uh, we started thinking we we're going to have a 7% budget decrease. That may not come to uh, pass, but uh, the, entire, the entirety of state government has really been hit. Uh, our department suffered 24% uh, budget decreases uh, uh, last year, over the last two years. And uh, the federal government going the way it is, too, it's, a, it's certainly an austerity movement we're facing. And so uh, we are going to need to choose our battles. We're going to need to put our resources where we can get the biggest bang for the buck. And it is certainly not business as usual. TMDLs, total maximum daily loads, when a stream is impaired, uh, we are obligated under federal uh, law to uh, restore that stream and to identify the pollutants that need to be removed. So that's called the total maximum daily load, or TMDL. Uh, the question is, should the legislature approve the TMDLs? Uh, there uh, frequently is a cost associated with uh, uh, restoring our streams. And the Jordan River is an urban waterway. We're doing a TMDL right now. Uh, we're, it's not ready for prime time yet. I've got it on my desk. We've got to make a couple of adjustments, and then we'll, we'll disseminate it to the public. But it is going to show uh, that we've got an impaired water, and that's uh, not a mystery to anybody. Um, uh, the question becomes, how do we clean it up? And uh, how much of it is, uh, is this person's responsibility? How much is that person's responsibility? And there was enough angst about what that may be and the cost may be uh, that uh, the parties thought it uh, would be a good idea to take that away from the, the Water Quality Board that is made up of all sectors of, the, of society in, in Utah uh, to determine what needs to be done and put it rather in the hands of the legislature to uh, determine if... Uh, you know, frankly, a water ought to be restored. And, and I, I do think some of that is a policy determination, but from my way of thinking, the legislative branch and uh, the executive branch are separate, and we probably would do well to keep them separate. And uh, uh, so we'll have to see what happens on that. The, those that had proposed that legislation are taking a step back, saying let's give this a year. I asked them to do that, and let's study this. Certainly we need to keep the legislature involved whether or not they should be the final uh, determiner of, uh, of uh, what needs to be done to improve our waters is the real question. And regulating pesticides, uh, not something that I thought was uh, going to be in um, my wheelhouse, uh, but the, the courts have ruled otherwise, and I think that was based on uh, a pesticide uh, kill uh, up in the northwest that uh, 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 wound up uh, with the mortality of, an, of uh, thousands and thousands of uh, fish. And uh, someone raised the question, why isn't this regulated under the Clean Water Act? And uh, the judge, uh, the courts ruled that it should be. Uh, heretofore, it had been regulated under FIFRA through the Departments of Agriculture. Uh, and FIFRA is the Rodenside Pesticide Etc. Act. And now they need a Clean Water Act or a, a, a discharge permit to apply pesticides. And mostly that will uh, 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 speak to um, mosquito abatement districts and large appliers of pesticides. But uh, I'm finding this right in, in my lap now that I've got to uh, issue permits to people that, A, don't want to be permitted, that don't know me from anybody, and I don't know them, we don't speak the same language, and we have no resources to implement the program. And uh, so we'll have to see where that goes. So sometimes my job is hard. That's me in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, uh, someone moved my cheese. It, uh, the, the courts, it's an interesting dynamic, and maybe we've always had this, but it is uh, the target moves frequently. My cheese is getting moved frequently. And so there is some uncertainty. The issue of jurisdictional waters is yet to be fully resolved. Uh, we have uh, received... Uh, uh, some guidance documents that were uh, leaked prematurely or with the consent of EPA and the Corps of Engineers, I don't know what, uh, which, but uh, in the last couple of weeks to better define what jurisdictional waters are because the Rapanos decision muddied that. Um, so we thought we were on sure fitting for many years and then we were not and uh, it is still a, a little bit uh, fluid. Uh, litigation. Every discharge permit now that uh, we issue on the Great Salt Lake is being challenged, and uh, and challenging is a, is a good thing. I think we, we need to be challenged. The science needs to be good. Uh, I did not think I needed to hire a staff attorney. I was wrong. Uh, I've got a mountain of uh, legal briefs on my desk right now, and it is frankly 
uh, distracting me from doing the work of the public, I believe. And so we are in a litigious environment, and uh, it is making it difficult to do our jobs. I've had to hire an attorney where before I had uh, a scientist that would help uh, uh, do the protection, and now I need a representative uh, to help me uh, navigate the, the legal straits. So uh, it's troubling, but it's where we are, and uh, we'll try to work through it. Where will the dollars come from? Um, I'm going to talk about the Great Salt Lake and the needs there, or the, the need to do good science on team TMDLs, or to advance standards and know that we're hitting the right target. And uh, it is unclear right now in these budgetary times where we're going to be able to carve out the dollars to, to meet those needs, let alone the needs that Bob uh, talked about in the needs survey of what kind of infra infrastructure we need nationally uh, to uh, be where we should be relative to critical environmental infrastructure. Will the courts ever make up their minds? And that has uh, a lot to do with someone moving my cheese. Uh, uh, but um, uh, we get different rulings, and then we follow that ruling. And, and EPA is very reactive to rulings uh, in courts. And so uh, whether that's pesticides, whether that's nutrients, uh, whether that's water quality standards, it is tough to, uh, when the target is going like this, it is tough uh, to take aim and, and uh, hit the uh, the middle of the target. Uh, where are the radical centrists? Um, um, it seems like in the environment and maybe even in politics right now, uh, uh, things are defined by the far left and the far right. And somehow, I, I believe that we need to get back into the center uh, so that it is not so polarized so that we can ad advance for the benefit of society uh, the things that we need. And uh, we need perhaps more radical centrist, and uh, um, I've been up at the legislature. Uh, they are not radical centrist, uh, um, and I don't know. That maybe I'm not among uh, radical centrist here. I, I, I don't know, but there needs to be a dialogue that we can have to uh, further, for the benefit of all of us, um, issues that pertain to the environment and, in my niche, water quality. Will someone please figure out the Great Salt Lake for me? Um, uh, we, that has been an enigma for many years, and uh, uh, Bob, we worked closely uh, uh, to develop the first standard for the Great Salt Lake to protect that lake from the influence of selenium uh, uh, toxicity. Uh, many would argue, and maybe Bob would, that we didn't get there. Uh, I think we have advanced uh, greatly from where we were, but there are so many other issues now, whether they be nutrients, and what are the effects of nutrients on Farmington Bay? Uh, what, uh, what about the, uh, the increasingly reduction of the water flows to the Great Salt Lake so that the footprint keeps reducing? How are we going to come to grips with that? Uh, what on earth is going on with mercury? And why do we have uh, uh, three species of ducks listed uh, for, uh, for mercury, the only ones in the country uh, for high levels of mercury? And then the variety of the other uh, pollutants du jour that we need to worry about to protect that magnificent ecosystem. The question I get asked when I, at, at social events, I, we exchange uh, pleasantries and I work for the Division of Water Quality and the first question is, how is our drinking water? And usually when they start that question I say, I have nothing to do with drinking water. Uh, I'm, I'm, although the Clean Water Act says it's clean water, I'm mostly introduced as the dirty water guy. Uh, and so we're protecting streams and lakes and uh, our waters. Uh, our 2010 integrated report says that uh, about two-thirds of our waters are doing well and about a third are not doing so well. Uh, they've eliminated the, 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 the category that says partially supporting, so you're either in or you're out, and uh, one-third of our streams are not doing very well. And uh, So what is the trend? We've kind of flatlined and maybe even starting to trend down a little bit. Uh, when we have an increasingly urban state, and Utah is not a rural state, it is an urban state, so when you have the trajectory of population growth going like this, and you have the water supply going like this, uh, to just stay even takes um, uh, more vigilance. Uh, it takes more expenditures for these uh, pollutant streams to be controlled. And uh, and we're, if that trend continues, it... Uh, we're in a losing proposition, so uh, uh, my response, if we're holding our own, we're doing pretty good, and that's uh, what we're trying to do right now and making the successes in some areas uh, uh, win them as we can. 
If uh, I was to uh, identify what are the foundational elements for uh, uh, protecting our water in Utah, I could bring this analogy of a four-legged stool, and these are the four legs of the stool. First, our anti-degradation policy, which defines three categories of water, one of which we will not allow any new point sources of pollution to go into. The second category says that we will allow pollution or discharges of pollutants to that stream, but not so that the ambient water quality changes. And the third one would say we can pollute that stream, add pollutants to that stream, up until we hit a threshold that the uh, simulative capacity of the stream will not allow the beneficial use, whether that be drinking it, recreating in it, agriculture, or for habitat, uh, that it will, uh, will protect still, even with the additional pollutant loadings, the beneficial use of the stream. Uh, then we have uh, the beneficial use classifications, and I just identified four of those. The fifth one is the Great Salt Lake, the enigma that uh, is the Great Salt Lake, but it is protected for its own beneficial uses. Numeric criteria, and that is a number. And so we know uh, levels of contaminants, either uh, concentration-based usually, of what levels of contaminants uh, can go into a water or can be found in a water uh, and not harm uh, the, the beneficial use. Now, there is a risk-based approach to that number, and typically that number is not developed uh, in my office. Uh, we have the ability to develop site-specific standards. We did so for the Great Salt Lake on selenium, but we rely heavily on EPA to uh, develop those standards. And our obligation then, when EPA develops those standards, is for us to be functionally equivalent to them or show why uh, a differing standard, either uh, less restrictive would be uh, more appropriate uh, or necessary. And uh, if we want to develop a, a stricter standard, we're at liberty to do that. Um, then we have our narrative criteria, which says it can't smell, it can't be visually offensive, we can't have uh, uh, oil spills, for instance. That's a violation of our narrative standard, aside from if there was any water quality degradation. So those are the foundational elements. Well, what's public enemy number one right now? And you see the smoking gun, and it is uh, nutrient pollution, um, both nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, we love it on our lawns. We, are in, uh, we love green lawns. We don't like green water. Um, so how does, that, how does that come about? Just a, 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 a little uh, explanation of, well, what's the big deal with phosphorus in our detergent or phosphorus and nitrogen in our fertilizers? Or, or in uh, manure going into our streams, what's, what's the big deal? Uh, it stimulates growth, just like what happens when we put fertilizer on our yard. It stimulates uh, uh, growth. Everything gets green. With my granddaughter, I don't know how many times I've watched uh, 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 Finding Nemo. And you, you know the analogy there with the fish tank. And uh, they quit putting oxygen there, and things got green. And that was the escape mechanism for Nemo out of the dentist's office. But, uh, so it stimulates uh, growth, and uh, uh, that, uh, that growth stimulates uh, th that uh, um, the algae growth, if you will. Is, uh, we have high dissolved oxygens in our water during the day, but at nighttime we have a sag. And uh, uh, the dead algae fall to the bottom of the stream. Uh, the dead algae decompose, and it sucks the oxygen out of our water. So we, we know about hypoxia in the Chesapeake Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. We see it in our Utah lakes and reservoirs. Uh, uh, we assess most of our reservoirs in the state. Uh, over a third of them are impaired because of nutrient pollution. They become sinks for nutrients. Uh, Matt Warner Reservoir in 2004 and again in 2010, we had cattle kills uh, because of uh, toxicity uh, from blue-green algae. Uh, even on our drinking water sources, and you may not be able to see this, but in the northern part of the state, there are two wells or two dots there that we've had to close drinking water wells because of the nitrate contamination. I don't know the, the smoking gun on that. I'm relying on our drinking water people to tell us. Is it fertilizer? Uh, is it failing septic tanks? Is it uh, uh, runoff that uh, came from an animal operation? Is it naturally occurring? We don't know. But uh, we know the ramifications, and we closed wells. Um, we're assessing our streams uh, so that we have some reference of how good our streams are doing. And we see that 24% uh, of our streams both have high levels of 
uh, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. And by high, meaning they're in the 75 percentile of, uh, of, uh, of our reference sites. And our reference sites are as good as uh, it can be expected. That does not mean uh, uh, July 23rd of 1847 before uh, the pioneers came into this valley. That means it is as good as we could expect given the circumstances these, uh, these streams have uh, faced over uh, the ensuing years. And so TMDLs, when uh, we have listed streams, we need to do TMDLs. This is East Canyon Creek. Uh, it was impaired because of nutrients, phosphorus problems. Um, and uh, you can see the algal bloom there and the uh, fish kills that resulted. Um, uh, we are looking at uh, a study. We finished a study this past year that would say, uh, would say if we had to upgrade all of our wastewater treatment plants, uh, what is the level of uh, treatment that we could expect and what is the price tag? And so we looked at four uh, different levels, uh, chemical addition just to get the uh, phosphorus out. If we've got to get phosphorus and nitrogen out, you've got to go to chemical addition and denitrification. Uh, if uh, you want to just get nitrogen out at lower levels, there are uh, you've got to get down to filters uh, to be able to get uh, the nitrogen out. So I'll look at a typical wastewater treatment plant, uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, this shows what they would need to add. The capital cost would be 131 million dollars to get down to 0.1 on phosphorus and 10 on nitrogen and you would see a cost increase of about $50 a month. The good news is, well, and this is another picture of East Canyon, uh, before Snyderville Basin upgraded its wastewater treatment plant to remove phosphorus, and that's what it looks like today. Uh, the oxygen is back, uh, fishery has been restored, no algal blooms, and so there is a benefit, but there is a cost. Uh, uh, just to give you a state perspective of this, uh, if we only wanted to remove phosphorus down to one point uh, one part per million, we would remove 80% of uh, the phosphorus loading in our streams. And uh, that is tons and tons and tons of phosphorus. The capital expenditure would only be $23 million. That raises uh, our sewer rates on average about $1.19 uh, a month. Doable, reasonable, and from my way of thinking is probably where we need to be and where we're going. Now, if we want to remove uh, total uh, or phosphorus and nitrogen, take nitrogen too, it's going to cost us $3 a month. If we want to get down to very low levels, uh, 0.1 for phosphorus and 10 for nitrogen, uh, you can see the cost there. It gets expensive. Net present value to do the least would be $114 million. On the high end, it would be $1.3 billion. We're doing a second phase of this study, though, and it will speak to what are the benefits to society, to recreation, to quality of life in removing these nutrients from our streams. Uh, how much uh, will it decrease uh, our drinking water costs? And so recreationally, will this be a better place to fish, hunt? Will people come here and spend their uh, tourist dollars? Uh, will they come here and recreate more? Uh, will uh, uh, the aquatic life, brine shrimp, uh, will they uh, th uh, thrive more with reduced nutrients or is that going to be uh, a negative effect on the brine shrimp? Drinking water, again, what is the cost uh, for us to remove those nutrients at the, the beginning of the system rather than keep them out of the system entirely? And the indirect values, uh, how much will our quality of life go up uh, for uh, having waters that aren't as green? Uh, I'm, I'm going to close just talking about recreational uh, use. Uh, uh, um, Bob spoke about this a little bit, and it is a risk-based analysis when we understand how we set our standards, and uh, uh, our standards are set based on certain thresholds and how many sicknesses are tolerable for people that go swimming because of E. coli or bacterial uh, 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 problems. Uh, we're sampling uh, in, outside of Zion's National Park because we're seeing higher levels, hits on bacteria. Uh, frankly, uh, identifying uh, bacteria in our waters has been difficult before because of holding times. We couldn't get the water to the labs in time uh, to be able to rely on the results. And now we have field tests that will allow us to do that. And uh, the results are, are not instantaneous, but we can get them within one day. So maybe this was the source of the problem in the Virgin River. We found an outhouse there uh, 
but in, in any event, one of the uh, the um, the crown jewels of our system, Zion National Park, has got a problem with water going in the Virgin East Fork of the Virgin or North Fork of the Virgin River, and uh, you can see those blips here. Well, what does that mean? We put up warning signs and we tell the public beware. That's not a very inviting sign if you're a tourist coming. Watch out for the water. Um, I'm going to just close. I was going to get into some pharmaceutical things here, but uh, our time is spent. Um, the challenges facing water quality are great. Um, uh, I am not a native Utah. I married a, a Utah girl, and I've been here now for about 35 years. Uh, and we're here still because of the quality of life. And uh, water quality is central to that quality of life. If we don't have good water quality, then uh, everything else fails human health fails, livability fails. And so I'm glad that uh, uh, we're here in Utah and collectively that uh, we can work towards a better water quality and a better uh, quality of life. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite our presenters to the front table so we might uh, each have a microphone. And according to the schedule, uh, and I must keep the trains on time here, uh, we have about, I've got about 15 minutes for questioning. So uh, let's uh, go at that. I think there are a number of stimulating comments and assertions and discussions today that really do stimulate some very serious questioning, so I hope you're in the spirit of that. Please direct your questions to the person you'd like answered, and we'll proceed. Um, so we've heard a lot about uh, um, restoring ecosystems and wetlands. Uh, my question for Walt is, um, you mentioned the salinity level of the Great Salt Lake, and I'm wondering about the, the causeway being a uh, separating the salinity from one side to the other, creating a deep brine layer that's um, environment for the methylation of mercury, that's, that's a big problem. Is there any talk about removing the causeway to, to help, help that? Um, good question. Uh, first of all, the remarks that I made were not so much about salinity, but sel uh, selenium. Uh, but the salinity of the lake, uh, we, the north arm of the lake is... Uh, uh, hypersaline, and uh, not much action goes on out there. Uh, the south arm of the lake has got a thriving brine shrimp uh, industry, and it, has to, it operates within various uh, uh, tolerances of, of salinity. Uh, there's no question uh, that putting that causeway in has uh, modified that uh, system. Uh, the salinity, that deep brine layer, it flows both ways. Uh, and uh, it presents some problems. Water, uh, to answer your question specifically, I know of nothing uh, uh, on uh, the front burner that says anytime soon that uh, causeway is going to be taken out. Water quality-wise, though, we're very <laughs> much looking at uh, revising our water quality standards out in the Great Salt Lake uh, to uh, base those standards on salinity levels and uh, uh, different ecosystems that develop based on salinity. So we're looking at that, but I know of nothing that takes that uh, causeway down right now. Can I, can I add? Please. So first of all, the, the causeway is far and away the biggest impairment of Great Salt Lake, um, no question. Um, second, my understanding is that the railroad is floating a proposal to replace part of the causeway, a small part, a 150-foot segment with a bridge which would, in fact, um, increase um, um, conveyance between the north and the south arm. Um, hydrologically, I'm not sure that's enough, um, but it would be a start. But it's a really important issue. Thank you. There's a question. Uh, I think I saw the hand in the far back, and then I'll come up to you. Yes. Uh, about the sources, where are most of it coming from? Is it industrial source, or are we seeing it from, uh, like, any type of runoff issue? I mean, I know western zirconium being right there on the Great Salt Lake, a major contributor. Is that really uh, – is it as big of a contributor as some believe, or where is the main source of the contamination coming from? Well, uh, um, 
I guess that's my question. Um, uh, there are many sources uh, and inputs of pollution or contaminants to the lake, and many of them uh, come from the streams that uh, the Bear River, uh, the Weber River, the Ogden River, the Jordan River, and other inflows uh, into the lake. Uh, there are some wastewater treatment plants that discharge directly in the lake. There are industries that uh, discharge into the lake, and they are all regulated uh, with discharge permits. And so they, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, we can have pollutants added to the, the Great Salt Lake or any other water body in the state if uh, we don't disturb the system to the extent that we can't maintain the beneficial use. And so we regulate them. They, we monitor them frequently uh, every month. And uh, if there are violations, we take action. So um, there are natural uh, pollutant sources, but some of these uh, that we're talking about, nutrients, for instance, that go into the Jordan and then into the impounded wetlands, uh, the question is, are they causing a problem? Um, uh, there's no question if I see Wayne Wurzbach uh, pick up a hand of goo and say, well, if this isn't a problem, what is a problem? I mean, look at uh, the, the algae bloom. The algaes on the duck ponds disappear, usually yearly. It's a highly managed system. Uh, we're trying to understand it right now, but uh, we're um, so to answer your question, what is the source, uh, there's a multitude of sources. One huge threat to the ecosystem right now is decreasing water quantity. Uh, I saw your hand next, so please. <coughs> and then Hi, I'm I Susan. I'm from Canada, so my question is not about Salt Lake. But uh, Joy has noted before that social scientists tend to have long preambles to their questions, so I'm just going to cut to the chase. Do politicians listen to scientists, and if not, why not? Well, it doesn't make the question any easier. <laughs> Some do, and I think there's a lot of uh, hope there. In Wisconsin, we have a wetlands association who exists primarily to lobby for wetland quantity and quality, and they have a strong uh, voice with uh, the legislature. I sit on the Nature Conservancy's uh, Board of Trustees in Wisconsin, and we have one legislative day per year when we go see our legislators and try to uh, get their ear, and it's nice that in that case that non-governmental organization has scientists on its board. There are two of us, and uh, I think that for the most part, they listen to us indirectly uh, by referring to uh, various writings or by having an, a, a liaison who may, takes that message or a lobbyist of sorts. Uh, I think perhaps the best example I can give you at the moment is uh, about Asian carp invasions. The probably all seen pictures of that giant fish that jumps out of the water, and the scientists are calling for uh, ex to uh, split the watersheds and not allow any interchange of water between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River, because that fish is coming up the Mississippi River. That's, uh, that's in response to scientists raising alarm bells. Very good. Please, ma'am, you go right ahead. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I'm also a social scientist, but mm -hmm. I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, uh, so I want to ask all of you to address a question that concerns me as a sociologist, which is that of um, structure and power. And I hear um, that a lot of the contaminants that are entering the water systems come from uh, people watering or putting fertilizer on their lawn, but also I guess industry has a role in this. I hear that communities have responsibilities to each other, um, yet somehow I find it unconvincing that communities are going to be able to challenge uh, what I see as fundamentally um, a rationality that puts economic activity before 
preservation of, of the ecosystem. Oftentimes, when it gets down to the nitty gritty, you're in the legislature and the ag business wants uh, a, uh, an exception made for their, their certain pollutants or, and you said, you know, <laughs> hopefully industry won't want that too, which of course they probably will if this gets passed. What about those challenges? And in your own areas of expertise, what do you see as the most promising way to try to create a balance of power between communities and some of the more powerful economic interests in society? Particular order and mindset? Uh, I'll throw that out to anyone that's brave enough to talk. All right. Uh, I'll, I, I'll take that on with, with two comments. Um, you know, I, the, well, I could speak for an hour on it, but there, there's clearly a power imbalance um, at most levels of government, the legislative branch, um, who has money for, for politics, uh, the Supreme Court decision on, on campaign financing is a good example. Here in Utah, um, the Water Quality Board, the other environmental boards that um, Walt talked about are highly representative of discharge interests, of industry interests. They're very poorly representative of citizen interests. There's one formal environmental group representative on the Water Quality Board, and the legislation that Walt talked about would um, reduce general public representation and increase agricultural representation. So that's clearly not um, representative. Um, the other thing that Walt mentioned was litigation. Um, and I know litigation has a bad name in many sectors of society, but as a, um, an environmental lawyer, I've negotiated environmental problems and I've litigated them. Um, and the courts provide an equalizer. Um, and I know that it's frustrating to Walt to have to spend time on the challenges to the NPDES permits, the Clean Water Act permits, to Great Salt Lake, but there are reasons for that. There are because there is disputes about the sufficiency of the permits. Um, and the litigation can provide um, uh, leverage for groups to have a seat at the table to actually have some power. So I would defend the role of our legal process as a way of allowing those who are disempowered um, to have a little bit more of a seat at the table. Could I add a comment on that? Uh, I think another check and balance is the executive branch. Uh, believe it or not, folks, we do track all of these bills. And if Walt Baker comes to us and says, you know, this will create a cascade from agriculture to industry, that sort of thing, it does get discussed with the governor. And, and we often go upstairs and find the representative promoting the bill and try to dissuade and try to keep the collision at the veto level fr uh, from occurring. But that does, and uh, I work for a pretty darn conservative governor. You all know that. But he has often taken active steps with legislators in his office discussing such matters. And I know uh, Walt's boss, Amanda Smith, and Walt are very much into this and advising uh, through our attorney, John Pierce. And so there is a check there. But I do agree with Bob. I think there's a lot of stuff that has to be done through the court system. Partly the problem is the legislature really doesn't have an, a issue development uh, function. It comes up there ready to pass law, much of it unscientifically based, because people just kind of can dream up what they want to do and bring it up. It might seem right to them. And to a farmer who's having economic troubles, he'll say, well, why not dump a little bit of extra? I don't mean to put a lot in there. But it means a lot when you look at the collateral aspect of it. And, and I think that the executive branch can often be the check, and it is. So uh, that is one part of it. I think we need to proceed. And, and so anyway, maybe we'll just see what happens. one swing at that, too. I, you know, in spite of the balances that we can have in the litigation, and I think litigation really has a place, because uh, for those that do not have a voice, maybe that is the last opportunity to have a voice. Uh, but sometimes the Cuyahoga River needs to catch on fire. Uh, uh, sometimes there's got to be a disaster to bring the attention to uh, whether that's a Red Butte oil spill, I don't know, whether that's a Cuyahoga River, whether that is uh, our air quality that uh, uh, we can't breathe. My wife is asthmatic. Nobody needs to tell me if it's a red, green day outside because I can hear her breathing in the morning. I don't need to look outside. So sometimes we need to have disasters to focus 
uh, public policy, legislative policy on uh, the matters at hand. Now, I'm trying to keep track of the hands going up, and this is getting to be a really tough exercise, but I, the gentleman in the uh, plaid shirt, I think you're next, yeah. and then I saw Terry back there in the back, <laughs> then you're next, and I lost track. Oh, wait a minute, I missed you. So I'll let you go after the gentleman in the plaid, okay? Please. Thank you very much. I have two questions, and short answers are, are fine. They're, they're, they're to all of you, but Mr. Baker probably the most. First, I see in Immigration Canyon a large number of for sale signs on some of the cabins up there. And a further checking shows that policy is requiring those owners to shift from outhouse systems to septic. Uh, the answer, my, my question is why is this? And of course the answer might simply be E. coli. But if there's more to that, Mr. Baker, comment on that. Second question has to do with the new policy in Salt Lake City allowing residents to catch and store rainwater from the roofs of their homes. And I, I appreciate that policy. I'm asking, though, why the quantities are so small, 50 gallons uh, or 100 gallons, something on that scale. Is it a matter of some fear that uh, too many homeowners will catch too much and store it? Or is it more of a safety issue, uh, mosquito abatement or child drownings? Perhaps uh, that would be the reason. Common Let me take general. a swing at the first one. First of all, uh, um, Immigration Creek has a problem with E. coli. That's one of the very few uh, uh, water bodies in the state that we have listed as impaired because of E. coli. Now the question is, what's the smoking gun? And the answer is we haven't been able to determine that yet. We've got some fairly sophisticated contracts with the University of Utah to do some speciation on E. coli to find out if it's elk or if this is human cost. And we're not quite there yet. We got a problem, in my opinion, in, uh, in Immigration Canyon because uh, we don't have sewer systems up there. Uh, they're on septic tanks, and I hope I don't see outhouses because the county uh, should not be uh, allowing outhouses up there. But um, in any event, we ultimately, that's a, it's kind of a planning level issue uh, <coughs> until we can find the science that would uh, demonstrate that uh, it is because of failing septic tanks that we've got a problem and not a wildlife E. coli problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes, please. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if the gentleman's second question got answered as far as yeah. rain, uh, rain. Do you want to grab that, Bob? And uh, I, I don't know the details of why they have a numeric limit on rainwater. Um, rainwater collection was controversial because of the prior appropriation system, and there's a legal issue about whether a homeowner can collect and use rainwater without an appropriative rights permit, which seems sort of absurd, right? Um, rainwater is a good source of gardening water in particular. But in the aggregate, I suppose, suppose it might be an issue. Colorado began the trend a couple of years ago in exempting rainwater collection from prior appropriation law. Um, but frankly, I don't know what the rationale was for the 50-gallon um, limit on that. I'm going to just say that it was probably the de minimis element of this, so that you didn't have somebody uh, having, uh, you know, 100,000 a gallon containment vessel to capture rainwater and thereby not being de minimis. So I'm only, I can't speak for Kent Jones, the state engineer, but I suspect that was just uh, some middle ground, a de minimis element of it. Okay, in, in his uh, introductory remarks, Ted uh, gave a big uh, list of problems and issues which we have in the state and he didn't say anything about global warming or climate change. And I was listening to uh, what, the, uh, uh, what the people said today, and the, the only uh, oblique reference to climate change came uh, by a remark from Walt when he said that we have a problem with decreasing water supply. And um, uh, I don't want to uh, kind of be, uh, seem like a doom and gloom person, but I have a very specific question about which I have had um, uh, conflicting answers. Is there something like a um, executive order or, or something like that in the state of Utah that policymakers are not supposed to make their decisions based on climate change? Oh, I could probably try to take a shot at that one. As you know, Governor Herbert has made it pretty clear that he's an agnostic on climate change uh, and prefers to remain there. 
by the same token, as our new energy policy will point out when released next week, he plans to manage as if there were. And that's important. And I think he's made that very definite step. Uh, if you're talking to Ted Wilson, I think it's a serious, desperate problem. And I think that we've got to deal with it. And I'm not sure it always comes up in the context of a water discussion, but it certainly is there. And we're looking at potential water changes in this state alone, let alone the rest of the world that are, that are dramatic. I think the first one we may see in this state will be the Colorado Plateau with a Hadley cell line <coughs> pole moving up to block it off from streams or flows of air that normally come in and provide some water in that dry area. Uh, and we may see even a wetter cycle in this part of the state, but we'll have reduced snow fields, which means less storage. And so it's all there. Uh, it is being discussed at the state level. It is a management problem, and the governor is attending to that. So, you know, how much she's attending to it is always a subject for public discussion, but I think it's one that's real. I now, let me, oh, pardon me, Bob, you should be right. next. I'm sorry, sir. I just want to watch our time here. I know we all need a break. I, I so. rewrote <laughs> half my talk last night and this morning so that I wouldn't repeat much of what we've heard for the previous day and a half. And so I cut out a lot of the climate change part of my talk. But much of what I talked about um, is likely to be exacerbated by climate disruption. Um, scientists are predicting um, widespread increases in cholera um, around the world because of um, – just talking about the public health aspects of it alone um, – predictions of um, much higher incidence of dengue fever in the United States because of northern um, migration, um, increased uh, migration of pests in the Great Plains um, because of climate disruption, which will result in increased use of herbicides and um, pesticides. Um, so many ramifications that it's difficult to, to stop. I can just make a quick comment that uh, so much of the emphasis on climate change is about average changes in temperature or average changes in precipitation. But when it comes to stormwater runoff that I'm dealing with at the moment, it's really more about increased extremes and more frequent extremes. So those pulses I talked about will be stronger and more common. And I think our ability to manage water is going to become more difficult. And uh, it's it's really... I think important that we all think about not just averages, but the extreme events, which will become more frequent and more extreme. Let me go back to Terry and then Wayne, and that's it. I'm sorry, unless you want to stay here and not go to the bathroom like I do. <laughs> um, just quickly, uh, and I guess this is to Walt. My understanding is, two-part question, my understanding is that the state of Utah cannot have any more stricter rule on any water or air quality issue than the EPA. Is that correct? Partially. Uh, there is a state statute that says uh, we cannot develop rules that are more stringent unless there is a purpose, there's a public hearing. So there is a caveat for that, uh, but uh, uh, generally the, the rules that we develop are not more stringent, but there could be circumstances. The second part, in your study at the end of your presentation, would you give some scenarios where they are more restrict and what those better benefits are by making them more restrictive? Or could that, is that a possibility? Well, uh, generally the case would be something on the order of what happened to the selenium standard in the Great Salt Lake. There was no uh, standard for selenium in a, in a saline water body terminal lake that EPA gave us. And so in the absence of an EPA standard, we needed to develop our own. Uh, there are site-specific standards that, that result from uh, studies that we do. If uh, we find out that uh, we've got a, an impairment, it could, uh, it may necessitate a site-specific st study so that we can tailor then parameters of discharge permits and protection to what the specificity is of, uh, of the water body. So that is fairly common that we do that. Wayne? Uh, I have two questions. One's generic. A lot of this information is very valuable, and I'm wondering if it's going to be available in some format. Uh, but the second question is for Bob. Uh, Bob, you start out with these premises on human rights. And it sounds like a lawyer arguing this before a court and so forth or something like that. But how generally acknowledged are these premises, and how much can they be used? 
in all kinds of different circumstances? Uh, well, well, that's a great question that, um, that Peter tried to field um, yesterday. Um, at the U.S. level, you know, most of our rights to environmental protection are statutory or um, common law um, based. We don't have a constitutionally based right to water or a clean environment unless it's an implicit right or a derivative right like Peter talked about yesterday. Um, at the international level, again, as we discussed yesterday, there's an increasing recognition of a right to water that includes um, both quality and quantity, and it, that includes a right to sanitation. Um, what that means in terms of enforceability um, is difficult. Uh, people cited the Botswana case yesterday in which it resulted in an actual change um, in, in individual rights and community rights. Um, there's a case in South Africa. There's a case in India in which courts have used the right to water to provide environmental relief. Um, but I think this is just something that's going to have to play out um, over time. On, on the Thank availability you. question, um, the entire conference is being uh, recorded, videotaped, and the, uh, the entire conference will be available at the Tanner Human Rights Center website, www.humanrights.utah.edu. And we'll also be collecting, uh, we intend to collect abstracts and some other material related to what's gone on the last few days. I'll have more to say about that at the very end. Well, let's thank our panelists. I think they brought invigorating, interesting stuff to us. Thank you all. Appreciate it very, very much. Thank you. Good work.